Today, when we think about the political world, we think about states, we think about nations, right? We think about politics around the world, immediately we think about uh, states, nations. That's the map that we look at mentally and actually uh, the way maps of the world are drawn today. So the world is made of states, or even worse, we assume the world is made of nations, right? So, in what follows, I'm going to pull up several maps that you also have on canvas, so you can follow along and check afterwards, and <coughs> just go through them and point out certain things about this idea that the world politics is made of nations. So let's let's do it. If you go on canvas. One of the documents I posted is a map of the world as we usually encounter it today. So here we see the typical image of different patches of different colors nicely separated with borders nicely drawn. So the entire world is made of countries, right? Of nations. Well, this is, first of all, a partially false idea. And second, it's a very recent invention. It's a very recent invention. You obviously know this if you have ever flown a, a plane across the borders, right? The borders are marked here. But if you fly to Canada or to Mexico or to Europe or fly, or fly across to Europe, Will you see different patches of different colors, nicely drawn and nicely separated? No. Because this is not the world, actually. These are all constructs that only were uh, put together, really, in the last two centuries. This is a very recent reality. In order to understand how recent it is and what caused the formation of these, these realities, well, these constructs, rather, let us go and look through history a little bit. If you go on canvas, rise of the modern state, you have support materials. So let's open them and I will invite you to do the same at home. So this is the world in the year 2000 BC. Now, where are the states? Well, did it mean that uh, you know, people didn't live there? Of course they did live there. So what was lacking was the uh, emergence of this very modern uh, reality, right? But they were politically organized, of course. They did never lived in a state of nature in the Hobbesian or Lockean sense, right? And you have these vague patches of color, right? Egypt, perhaps, was the one that was, was most organized, but even there it wasn't in the way we understand states today, and we're going to talk about this soon. So this is 2,000 years ago, but you see, there are different, you know, people living everywhere. Right? So, where are the nations? Where are the states? Well, let's go further. One thousand BC. And you see, again, uh, a thousand years later, you're still around the same situation. Again, you have uh, centers of power in Egypt, centers of political uh, organization power in, in Babylonia, but that uh, Israel is uh, formed as a loose confederation of tribes, right? This is just a vague civilization. Again, where are the nations? Going further to 500 BC, you see uh, the emergence of a so-called empire, the Persian Empire. And we're going to talk about how they, how they were organized, but now let's just go to the maps. You see the emergence of the Greek region, but it wasn't a state. We talked about this, they were city-states, right? If you zoom in, you see uh, different city-states. 
you know, Greeks in general, Greekish culture, Grecian culture, and so on. Again, loose. It's fortunate that the map does this and cannot do anything else. To s it gives you a sense of how loose these uh, organizations were. And we're going to discuss what this meant. And then 180. There you are. You can zoom in, zoom out. Again, you see different different patches of color. Why are there different patches of color? Because different sources of political power were able to project their influence in vaguely, vaguely speaking, in these uh, in these areas. Right? These were not states as we understand them to today, as you'll see. And that's 100 uh, BC. Five, uh, 100 AD, sorry. 500 AD. What's going on, right? The Roman Empire, for example, has uh, fallen apart by this time. The only remaining one is the Eastern Roman Empire. You have, you have all kinds of populations. Tribes, Lombards, Jacobins, Yadamans, the Thuringians, the Saxons, well, where are the nations that we're talking about today in this state? Right? Well, and what? This white part, is it that nobody lives there? No. 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 So, in Western Europe, you have literally uh, this fluid uh, reality, right, of various tribes, and that's a form of political organization. Uh, entering alliances, occupying, moving around, and so on. And we're going to continue with uh, focusing on uh, the map of Europe across the centuries because the modern reality of the nations of the state, or what we call then the nation state, actually was born in Europe. And then in the 19th century, it literally spread around the world. <coughs> it was shaped mostly in Europe, and in the 19th century, spread around the world. Unfortunately, the world doesn't necessarily ex um, fit this specific reality that was born in Europe. So we're going to fo focus on Europe in order to understand how the modern nation state actually came about. So this is the year 700. Again, you see mostly Germanic tribes. Guess what? The Franks, uh, who occupied this territory where before them were the Gauls and before them the Celts and there these populations all mixed and so on, right? Well, where are the French? The Franks were Germanic tribes. So where are the Germans? There is no Germans, right? Germanic, we just point out and say that well that's kind of the origin, right? <coughs> where are the Italians? Well there's no Ita Ita Italy uh, in, in the sense in which we understand or Italian identity. You see. All these identities are shaped later. So this is the seven hundred 800. This is the famous moment when um, Charlemagne, who was uh, a Frankish um, stronger ruler, expands his control over a larger territory. But control just meant that you know he could reach as far. That's all he said. Well, where is Germany? Yeah? Where are the Germans? Well, here are uh, here is 900. And in 900, you see what happens here. This is, this is good because it points out to how this phenomenon actually took place. You see uh, a West Frankish region and an East Frankish region, and then there's a, actually two more Frankish regions. What happened after Charlemagne's death, uh, his sons uh, were received parts of uh, his former uh, you know, realm or whatever he controlled. And if you notice, they correspond, broadly speaking, with what later will develop into France and into uh, Germany. Okay. But you see how, how this, uh, at this point there is no such reality. Those identities that now we consider so absolute as German or French or whatever it is, right, 
they're not absolute identities. They didn't always exist, and we just naturally put them into a box. The, they are constructed, they are built, they grow over time, they're shaped. Why? All these were Germanic, Germanic, right, broadly speaking, tribes. Why, the, why, were, why then did these, this territory become friends, speaking French, which is a Latin based language, and why the, did this territory uh, develop into, well, a Germanic state, many, right, speaking German, right? What is, what is going on? It's the same origin of tribes, so what happens? It just shows you that these are very concrete historical forces that shape and then give rise to different linguistic, cultural groups, right? But do they matter? Why would we care about them? Well, as we will see, for most of history, they didn't really matter. So let's go to 1080. You see the emergence of new. These are actually, you know, you know. Again, it's nice that they put such vague borders because there are no borders. Because you see why? Because the very concept of borderism is a recent concept, the way we understand it. Um, but you have the emergence of uh, Hungary, more or less. You know, uh, Croatia, Bulgaria. Clearly, not in the way we understand it today with Bulgarians that they had. A, they were just developing the you know, continuously developing their identity, and who knows, a thousand years from now, this is the year 1000, who knows a thousand years from now, what this identity will actually be, and, you know, if there will be a specific identity called Bulgaria. Uh, jumping uh, ahead, 1300, well, yeah, this is Europe, so where are our states, right? But you did see something that certain states that you know today, you, you see them earlier on, and what you see though is that there has been a territory that continuously has maintained its shape with a certain continu continuity over five, six, seven centuries, and one of them is, is, is what we today call uh, France. And there is the United Kingdom, of course, this is a process of, of growth and incorporation. There is no Spain, right? There is no Spain. Spain is a very problematic concept even today. If you ask Catalans or Basque, right, uh, population uh, from Spain uh, today. So where is Germany, right? Obviously not. You have thousands of princedoms and kingdoms, king, uh, princedom and bishoprics and so on, uh, of vaguely Germanic origin. And the same in, in uh, remember Machiavelli? Well, this is Italy, right? Not even in the sense of the country, but the Italian peninsula. You see, you have all kinds of different city states and so on. Well, how, why, they, why were they Italy? Well, Italy is a reality that is constructed. As you saw from history, there never existed an Italy as a, as a state, right? There was the Roman Empire, who killed its neighbors to expand, including those from the Italian peninsula. It was the Etruscans before the Romans were actually dominated the peninsula. I'm just pointing out, so look at, you know, Hungary, well, this is a gigantic state, right? Because it controlled, uh, it, it controlled the king, whoever it was, controlled many populations of many languages, many cultures, because guess what? That didn't really matter. That didn't really matter. So we're going to talk more about this, but just to give you a, a, a visual picture first, uh, what we're talking about. And then, the year 1600, getting closer to modernity, getting closer to Hobbes, right? Hobbes to live here, right? And to Locke. Uh, and again, you see certain realities that you recognize more, more, you know, it's a constant reality here, uh, which just means, the only thing that it means, it means that there, there was a political structure with enough continuity, mostly through dy dynasties, mostly through inheritance, to pass rule from one generation to the other, and then to ensure that uh, this territory mostly remains in their hands. That's the only thing that it meant. You didn't have border patrol and uh, you know coast guard and so on and little you know uh, wire barbed wire or walls or whatever. Right? It's just that this was vaguely <coughs> the territory that was controlled with a certain constancy by certain dynasties. Because dynasties were the ways to maintain to transmit 
stability, political stability. But we're going to talk in a, in a second more. Um, but you know, you you were born in some princedom here with all these hundreds of princedoms. So could you enter into France? Of course, because there was no such border. You could live wherever you want. But in a second more on this. 1600, and here's Europe at the time of the Peace of Westphalia, a very important moment. Right? But a good example is here's the Ottoman Empire, right? ruling over Bulgarians, Valachians, Moldavians, who will later become, you know, kind of define themselves as Romanians, Hungarians, Bosnians, Serbians, Slovenians, who never had a state, uh, Albania, so you see a multi uh, ethnic empire multi-religious and so on. Poland, of course. This is so many Polish people? No, of course, that wasn't the point. But it was, the, the definition of the state was not linked to any sort of language. It included Lithuanians, it included Germans, it included others and so on. Again, this mix of principalities both in the Italian peninsula. However, why is 1648, the Peace of Westphalia, very important? As, um, it's the, basically, it's a key moment when a very modern concept of sovereignty is defined. And in a second we'll talk more about this. But this is why you have this map, because this is a moment when, after religious wars, the concept of sovereignty is defined. And jumping right ahead, this is after the French Revolution, after the Napoleon's Wars, 1815. Again, hard to recognize the countries that you know today. For example, uh, where is Poland? Poland actually doesn't exist, although it's marked here uh, just in letters because, as you see, it has been carved out between Prussia, Austria-Hungary, what is that country? And, and the Russian Empire. Right? Ottoman Empire, many Germanic states, many small states under different control here. Uh, you have the ma maintenance of, of this new reality called Spain. France, you see, there's a continuity, and the Great Britain has expanded, incorporated Scottish, Welsh, Irish, not necessarily, you know, to their happy, uh, they weren't necessarily very happy with this, of course. Yeah. I remember Braveheart and uh, the movies uh, about I I Irish independence. So, the Great uh, Britain expanding, London actually expanding its, its power. This is 1815, and it takes to 1870, basically, which is only 140 years ago, which is yesterday, and even not even then, to have more, more familiar uh, entities. Suddenly you have a France, suddenly you have Germany, a German Empire. Guess what? It's the only first time in history that Germany exists. It's 1871. First time in history. Right? Italy never existed until 1871, the same, same decade. Right. History was not leading towards this moment. History didn't have to get here. There are specific forces at play that assure that these realities were born. And those are the forces that we're going to talk about because otherwise we're in the danger of assuming that, well, this is the world. But clearly this isn't. This is something that only yesterday was invented. Good. So this is a brief overview. And actually, the, the world you know, <laughs> we know today it's not even this, because you see, you see Austria, Hungary, you, get, you see a multinational Russian Empire, you still see an Ottoman Empire. The world, the, the, the entities you see today on the map are actually only after World War I that they start resembling today's map and being confirmed after World War II. And the process never ends. After the fall of communism, other states are defined, for example, for former Yugoslavia and so on. So let's see then. How does this work? And why do we have uh, this new reality of, of the modern state?